Hi, um, welcome and thank you for coming along to this workshop which will be exploring the lost voices of partition and how conflict um, impacts on the memories and socialisations of older women who have aged in the UK. So I'm Nafisa Ali, I'm a lecturer in sociology and I have recently completed a project which was funded by the NU Social Sciences Pilot Project Fund. <clears throat> so this project was a collaboration between um, the university and a organisation in Scotland where we conducted several workshops which included intergenerational workshops, so workshops with older um, migrant women, women who were in the mid-age range between 35 and 55, and younger women who were aged 18 to 30. So the workshops aimed to examine the way in which the partition of India has informed socialisations for older women who have now come to age in the UK. So the reason for this is as the child survivors of partition have aged, contemporary social science literature has barely acknowledged the long lasting impact of partition and the impact of the sexualisation of women and girls of all ages, particularly those who have lived partition and who are now in later life. In Holocaust studies, child survivors have only recently come to the fore as having experiences that were distinct to adult survivors, written by Krell in 1993. Therefore, to appreciate the ways in which South Asian migrant women claim desexualized later life positions, it is useful to examine how the interconnections of socio-historic events, such as the partition of India and Pakistan, magnified the sexualization of the female body to make it sexual or viewed in a sexual way. But also to trace the way in which early life course socializations of gender and femininity continue to say, shape intersectional, ethno-religious and cultural sexualities. For older migrants who have aged in their place of migration and settlement, Inclusive insights in partition studies can only occur when we extend discussions from generalised partition experiences to those that ameliorate and include deeper understandings of the intersections and complexities of gender, age, sexuality and nation. Particularly that has been lived across transnational histories and geographies over the last 76 years. So the aim of my project, The Lost Voice of Partition, which was funded by Northumbria University Social Science Fund, aimed to examine early life course socialisations and the intersecting politics of nation, gender, age, sexuality for older South Asian migrant women who settled in the UK but migrated in the late 1950s and 60s. These women are now in later life and they are the child survivors of partition. For centuries, a South Asian woman and her body has been constructed in various ways, such as pre-partition ayahs, nannies, who were viewed as sexually empowered, were sought by many wooers. In partition literature, women's position further reflects a focus on desire and piety and how they were considered secondary to men. Also, Western-centric discourse referring to South Asian women has repeatedly reduced them to stereotypes of the passive, passive silent Asian female victim, or cliched symbols of the Orient who are sexual and erotic. The construction of these images creates women's bodies again as a site for the performance of gender and cultural symbolism. Yet Vinay critiques these images at the intersections of sexuality and political rule, but arguing that the effects of colonialism and the cause of sexual repression in South Asia are a consequence of British rule and its categorization of its subjects as desexualized or hypersexualized compared to normalized pre colonial attitudes towards sexuality. Furthermore, sociocultural scripts position South Asian women with expectations of the proprietors of religion 
or the safeguarding of purity and integrity of the communities rooted in the cultural and religious politics of South Asia. Third space understandings, unconscious, unspoken, shared by individuals, communities and societies that centre around ways of seeing, construct the South Asian woman and her body with powerful cultural, political and national meaning. Mahanaram, 2019, persists that this link between sexuality and women's embodiment becomes shared within a nation. Besides, distinct social recommendations for honour, which also existed before partition, were amplified to foster a heightened value on tradition, conformity and security rules. Consequently, the externally induced changes in society as a result of the event had a direct impact on family and societal strategies around protecting vulnerabilities and how they functioned. One sociocultural practice that has been pivotal is the term izzat, which translates to honour. This is a South cultural term and spoken in the Punjabi and Urdu language. Izzat is a performance of the public part of the self which shapes subjective behaviours but is also an important indicator of collective honour. The use of izzat as a sociological construct was widespread in social science literature in the late 1990s and 2000s on examining the intersections of South Asian women and diasporic identities. Research on Izzat has since included intergenerational negotiations in the UK, honour killings and domestic violence, parenthood, masculinity and caring roles within family, sexuality, sexual abuse and the shame in using mental health services. Just to name a few. So whether the term is outdated in the context of diasporic lives is a question we must consider. But for this cohort of older women in later life, is it remains relevant as many continue to carry it across the life course. So during partition and immediately after, is it was negotiated with both positive and negative political gains, where it was either performed with the need to guard female sexuality or to dishonour the nation through the torture, rape and or slaughter of women. The protection and preservation of the female body was a significant characteristic of how Izzat was socially constructed and mobilised to promote moral behaviours, responsibilities, practices and expectations. Its value is situated in the pursuit of preserving and concealing sexuality, sexual intimacy and sexual maturity habitually achieved within the social sphere, family, community and nation. Furthermore, is it is not momentarily, but it moves across the girl or the woman's life. The preservation and protection of is it, however, varies across cultural and religious interpretations, but notably share connections with subjective reward, for example, heightened honour, respect or increased reputation. Here, brother, covering or seclusion can heighten or strengthen is it by creating spaces for mobility for women and girls within the home. Education and spaces of employment. And Pina Webner, 2005, Rumi and Harrison, 2010, write extensively on this. After partition, Burda was employed by both sides to protect women's vulnerabilities. Another sociocultural construct was early marriage, in this instance referring to instances where marriage occurred under the age of 16. For older South Asian migrant women, now in later life, early marriage was common. See Dwyer, 2020 and Jones, 2020. The premature sexualization of women and girls through marriage was challenged by Gandhi when he drew attention to Hindu practices that encultured this practice and said, <clears throat> I passionately desire the utmost freedom for our women. I detest child marriages. I shudder to see a child widow and shiver with rage when a husband, just with, widowed, with brutal indifference, contracts another marriage. He goes on to finish. I realise the difficulty of this problem. The constraints of child marriages highlight the premature sexualization of girls, but as a form of gender socialization. Moreover, these practices are not isolated and still occur across areas in South Asia and the sub-Saharan continent today. See UNICEF 2015. 
Early marriage built on the foundations of Izzat aimed to ensure sexual activity took place within ethno-religious and cultural conventions. Moreover, sociocultural recommendations for South Asian women, daughters, wives, nieces are characterised by their sexuality. These ideals encourage girls to internalise perceptions of women's sexuality as dangerous with a need for regulation and control. Moreover, sexuality as a patriarchal property verified to be